Uh, so welcome. Let's do a quick, if we could, uh, just introduction around the room as to who you are and, and where you're from and, and what your role is. Hi, Mila, over here in uh, Vancouver, Canada. I've got the world's best job because what I get to do is work with community champions around the world in about 40 different cities to help them build out tech for good communities of practice, like this one being created here by Bob. I work for TechSoup Global, a nonprofit that helps other nonprofits get access to technology for free or at discounts, all kinds of pretty amazing stuff there. And if you're a nonprofit charity church or library, you should definitely go check it out. Link in the chat. Thank you very much, Eli. Thanks, Bob. My name is Nathan Frankenberger. I'm an IEP master's student. I'll graduate next month. I was able to do a work study opportunity where I work with Bob and then one of the guys at the, at the school for a work study community engagement workforce development. And then I'm also a member of the local community pride board here in Punxsutawney. I do some revitalization and investment. And so definitely looking to learn on the nonprofit side of things to make tech is where it's at. So anything I can take away from this, I'm excited to learn. Thanks for having me. Thank you very much, Nathan. Lynn. Good afternoon. My name is Lynn Williams, and I'm the executive director of the Great Careers Groups. Uh, it's greatcareers.org, but it's Great Careers Groups. We provide career education and networking to people who are in career transition, meaning job seekers, as well as provide career education for people who do career management, meaning self-employed and employed. We've been around since 2010, and we run about 40 to 50 events a month, and they are all online. I'm based out of King of Prussia, Pennsylvania, and so I'm the executive director of the group. But to make a living, I also uh, write resumes and LinkedIn profiles. And I'm working on my doctoral dissertation on the topic of LinkedIn for job seekers. So that's me, Lynn Williams. Interesting. Thank you, Lynn. I got to ask a quick question. Are you associated at all with the workforce investment funds and the monies that come through the workforce investment boards? No, we are a 501c3 nonprofit. We are on TechSoup, but we are independent. We basically sustain ourselves and survive based upon our very small membership fee of only $49 a year to attend 600 events, which is we have to pay our uh, virtual assistant, our insurance, our software and that TechSoup doesn't offer us, as well as our hosting costs and whatnot. So we are not involved in anything workforce development, but we, I, know, I suppose we, we could be because we, we do an awful lot and help an awful lot of people. Thank you. I would be interested that I've served on two workforce development boards for probably a total of 20 plus years. It sounds like you would be an ideal contractor for workforce development. So I'd be interested to have maybe a follow-up discussion. Uh, Absolutely. I'll put my book of call information in, in the chat. Sounds good. Excellent. Eric, tell us about yourself, where you're at, where you're from. Or Eric Jacobson. I'm a uh, retired engineer, project manager. I'm here today as uh, from the First Unitarian Church of Baltimore okay. nonprofit. I'm very active in the church. I'm the treasurer involved in audio visual systems and other activities at the church. Thank you very much. That's uh, so you're bringing your engineering background to the community at your church, basically. Uh, Correct. Yep. Mm -hmm. And I'm, yeah, my name is Bob Carter. Um, I'm on my home is in Poxitani, Pennsylvania. My bio is on the TechSoup work on TechSoup site. So I'm not going to repeat a lot of that. I will admit that I'm a tech junkie, so I have that addiction. And uh, when I was working full time as the executive director of the community action agency, and then I wore several hats in the military that were technology related, and I would often get accused of being on the bleeding edge of technology, where you often shouldn't be maybe until something is tried or tested. But uh, it was usually worked out for me, which allowed me to excel. And uh, so I've learned a lot about technology. I've, I've probably become one of those people that engineers and other highly specialized, trained networking people are afraid of because I ask too many questions. And uh, I do a lot of troubleshooting that later has to be undone. But anyhow, long story short is there 
I think one of the things that nonprofits lack, and I was the executive director for almost 30 years for one, is the ability to mobilize technology to, to make it basically what I call a force multiplier in your organization. And that's one of the reasons I wanted to become a host in Pennsylvania. Pennsylvania currently does not have any other hosts. And I'm hoping from this group, we spin them up in other cities and other towns here to Pennsylvania. But it's great to have you guys all on board. Everybody, of course, is welcome. And just to clarify something that, you're, that Eli and I have talked about several times is TechSuit provides primarily software and hardware. And we're going to cover some of this in the Zidra slides to 501c3s, you do not have to be a 501c3 to participate in any of these Twitch sessions like today. They're open to really anybody that wants to be, to register for an event. And there's plenty of them out there. Every day there's a list of what events being hosted from all over the country. And some of them are very sophisticated and others are very basic, but they're all very valuable to, to help people learn about technology and how it's being implemented. I see somebody joined us. I'd like to welcome them. Is it, is Bart your first name or your last name? Or tell us a little bit about yourself. Sorry, it's just the uh, abbreviation. It's Brian Burkett calling from Grand Forks, North Dakota. Nice. Uh, can you tell us who you're with there? Yeah. Uh, uh, University of North Dakota Alumni Association. Oh, great. How did you hear about this one in Pennsylvania from Dakota? <laughs> it just showed up in my in my mailbox and, and, and picked it out. Yep. Great. Thank you for joining us. Actually, I, I must admit I'm sitting in Florida as I speak right now, where it's probably about 85 degrees and sunny. So those of you that are in Florida climates, I'm not going to make any big deal on that. I was going to put that full behind me, and I decided that probably wasn't the best thing to do. But it's funny because in all the years that I've been involved in nonprofits, one of the one of the things I'd like to bring to nonprofits is trying to show them how to leverage technology. And I found TechSoup to be an extremely valuable asset from a variety of means. One is because it can offer reduced hardware and software. But I think something that's most that's even more important is it brings people together. It allows us to form a network of people that, that, for example, Ari can call and say, hey, I'm trying to do this, or would you know of a product, or do you know anywhere I could get this at a discount, or I'm trying to develop a specification for a, a, a small server for my facility, and all of a sudden you have a list of names and contacts that you can reach out to in the community. And uh, the other thing is I want you to to keep in mind that you have the ability, especially as a final 1C3, but, but other organizations do to become hosting sites for university tech interns. They could be a management information system intern. They could be a computer science coder. They could be a, an engineer support person, somebody that just builds and maintains and troubleshoots workstations. I had my first intern in technology was in 1979 and my nonprofit would not have had any way to develop the technology we did if it wouldn't have been through the use of interns. And even till today, I have maintained contact with all of those interns I had over from 79 forward. Most of are making probably three or four times when I ever be working for the nonprofit. Somehow when we go to dinner, I still end up in a chat, but it's still nice to know that I mean, that I was able to mentor and also be mentored by kids and, and youth and now adults that have a lot of great, uh, a lot of great knowledge. And in Pennsylvania, there's a lot of programs for interns to be placed with nonprofits for either nothing or for minimum wage, or they can, the nonprofit can register for the Pennsylvania Higher Education Association and get a reimbursement for interns that are on site. That would be another asset that I would highly encourage, no matter what state you're in, to look into what's available, particularly in today's world of, of trying to help other people, what resources are available in the area of uh, getting interns at your site. There's a lot of nonprofits can't afford the tech staff that we'd like to have. I, you guys all come to the table with various resources at your fingertips, knowledge, and please feel free to share any of those that any of that information as we go on. 
Oh, some of these slides, uh, I'm going to bring up that slide presentation just so we can see where I'm headed. Okay. So basically I think I've covered everything that's on this slide. Everybody can bring something to the table. So please feel free to, to offer any suggestions or ideas or experiences that you've had. Line tech soup, that's affordable tech for nonprofits. It definitely you're, supports. You're not sharing any slides. Okay. Yep. I guess it would be nice if I did share before I did that. Bear with me. <laughs> Thank you very much. Here, and going back to, sorry about that. Share. I think this is the right one. Now, I'm okay. Okay, thank you. No. Again, horrible tech for nonprofits. Just curious, is anybody in the list non final one C3? So everybody can take maximum on advantage of tech soon. So I already said this isn't something that's just local, by the way. Um, it, the first session that I did in October, I actually connected with a, a group that is doing something very similar to what we're doing right now in Nigeria, and I, I hate to use the word Nigeria because it brings around a lot of connotation about spam and whatever, but there is a, a, a nonprofit in Nigeria and it has a couple of for-profits attached to it that develop and build websites. And I actually used one of those for-profits to build a website for a regional economic development corporation that I'm a board member on. The total cost to build that website, which I ended up donating to the Economic Development Corporation was $470. So it wasn't like a major expense because they're trying to gain a reputation outside of Nigeria. There's a one way of bringing people together. There's a huge amount of educational content on TechSoup and we won't, I won't spend a lot of time with that, but boy, if you haven't had a chance to just go to the TechSoup site and, and dig around, please do so because you're going to find lots of free, uh, valuable content. And of course the whole issue of TechSoup is a global community and it's a, a great opportunity to share information. This basically just shows you what's available through TechSoup. Basically it falls into the hardware software side, anything from refurbished hardware to projectors, to hot spots. And here's some of the companies that contributed to TechSoup. Of course, what's the advantage, you know, why would a company do this? The way it works is basically a company makes the, probably a final, a tax deductible contribution of hardware and software to TechSoup. And then it, TechSoup distributes that for usually a very small processing fee to the nonprofit. For example, I know when I was at my last job at the community action agency, we were able to get gigabyte Cisco switches for very minimal cost, like a $12,000 switch cost us a couple hundred dollars, which was the processing fee that was, you know, TechSoup was passing on to us, but the actual cost of the switch would have been unaffordable to the nonprofit if we would have purchased it through TechSoup. The same with Microsoft licensing, I know not the TechSoup has changed, excuse me, Microsoft is changing some of its licensing processes. So you'd want to check that out, but you can see, and this is just a small when I say Dell and Adobe and QuickBooks and Cisco and Symantec, that's just a small grouping of, of items that are available. If you go to their site, you can see all their products, what they're available and what the eligibility is to be able to draw down on their products. Very reasonable pricing level. Again, primarily available to final 1C3s, public libraries with an IMLS listing, friends of library groups, final 1C3s, and many foundations and churches. You, again, the registration process is very straightforward. Registration is free. You submit a qualification document in a very short period of time. You get a turnaround that you're eligible with the user ID and password, and that gets you access to basically everything that's out there. They also have a lot of services available. And I'm going to get on, on some of these already, but like their, their managed IT services, the TechSoup courses, which are invaluable. They do have consultation available, help desk services, very reasonable cost. The biggest problem with a nonprofit in, in IT, it's definitely better today. I've been in the nonprofit business long enough. When you wanted to swap out your typewriter for a computer, 
you had to write a 10 page justification. It's like why the computer was considered um, non essential. Now, most Honduras today consider a computer to be essential equipment, and the, the cost associated with it is considered a supply versus an equipment cost, which means it's much easier to purchase. As a matter of fact, most nonprofits are expected to have a website to be able to post certain documents. Grantors have accepted the idea that nonprofits need technology, and technology is one of the few things in our life that has become less expensive over time. However, it's still a cost to the nonprofit. Sometimes it's considered an admin cost, which is those of us who are in the nonprofit business know that administration dollars are usually very minimal when it comes to a nonprofit. Anything over that five to seven to 10% is considered abusive or, or waste of resources. And uh, there's got to be one of the things we'll talk about briefly today is some ways to deal with that. But again, all these things available through TechSoup. And then again, these webinars, how to articles and blogs, all available through TechSoup. And that, if you're a member, I'm sorry, that was a lot of redundancy. And if you're not a member, I hope it whet, whet your appetite to go check out what is TechSoup and how can I benefit from it. What I wanted to do today primarily was have a dialogue with nonprofit managers and staff regarding how do I bring technology into the nonprofit? And what I've learned is, as an executive director, nobody had to sell me about the advantages of technology. Maybe some of that was because I spent many years in the military and I learned, I learned the advantages of email. In 1995, I was trying to sell to my command in the military that there's, we can go from communicating from seven in the morning till six o'clock at night to communicating 24 seven, if we would go to an email concert. So they gave me like a $6,000 budget to implement email. And I'm talking about a five state reserve command in 1995. Within three or four months, my budget went from $6,000 to like $100,000. And the next year I had a $20 million budget for technology. When I left, it was $70 million because we started to connect all of our sites together via fiber optic to, for cyber security reasons and for the speed of being able to communicate. So I, I learned very quickly of the advantages, at least as a manager, sometimes staff can see those things as advantages, by the way, but I've learned that the advantages of technology in doing business, and to me, I see it as a way of maximizing time, as a way of getting most of us, the other thing that's very unaffordable in nonprofit is staffing. I found that by implementing technology, I could do more work with less staff. Not that I wanted less staff, it's just that I couldn't afford more staff. So that I had to find a way to sell it. So either it was in the military or it was in the nonprofit. And the piece of the nonprofit was to the board. And uh, I had a multi county nonprofit made up of nine members from each county. Um, one third of that board was public elected officials and one third was low income representatives and one third was business. And so I had to sell them. And these are some of the things that I try to use to sell technology to the board of directors and the same in the military. The, the first and foremost, it, I don't care what kind of organization you're in, probably have a mission, whether it be the church or the the business or whatever it is, and anything that you write related to technology should first and foremost articulate how technology can help you accomplish that mission. I think there's many other things like estimating the technology costs, board members and, and other people in leadership and governance, they want to know what it's going to cost. And, and don't be fooled by the fact that technology is just not a one-time cost. Technology, like most other costs, whether it be a building or be staff, it has on because there's an ongoing cost. And now today you have options. You don't have to buy technology, you can lease technology. So there's a way of building it into the budget every year where it's going to cost you. You don't have to have equipment on site. It can be done by cloud services. If you have the bandwidth to support cloud services, sometimes in rural areas, you don't. Another hat that I wear is I sit on two local school boards. 
and during the COVID period of time, that the school boards had to issue 600 hotspots so kids that were working from home could use the cell service to communicate because they did not have the broadband in their local areas. And we really did a lot of advocacy with our Congress people to say, rural America, like the rest of the world in our urban areas, are entitled to broadband to keep, excuse me, to keep a, uh, to keep uh, on an equal platform with people in the rural areas. Again, I think you have to be able to, re to be able to articulate a return on investment, how to save money over time through the use of technology. One that maybe often people don't think about is how does it improve customer experience? I don't care if that customer is a, uh, a client or a, a consumer of a service or if they're a business client, they, how do you make that customer experience better for the use of technology? I mean, that could be a, a ticket or reminder ticket about when to come for your next appointment. It could be a thank you note after the service is provided. But all those things have, are, lend themselves to being hot of it could be a church bulletin. Again, there's many ways of improving, improving customer experience. Employee productivity, I think, is another critical one. Everything from completing a timesheet online to being able to produce for employees what their actual costs are to making it easier for them to communicate with their peers and external entities that they deal with. One that I'm very, I've, I've always been very financially conscious in a nonprofit. My nonprofit was anywhere from six to ten million dollars annually, so it was all about including organizational controls. And in other words, how do we show that we're being accountable? How do we show transparency in the way we did business? And I felt with technology, it was easy for me to capture data, put data in a form that was easily understood by the public, and then put it out on the website, whether it be a nine ninety in the form of a annual tax document or the manual report in terms of charge and diagrams, it just, the technology just made that so much easier to demonstrate that you were being accountable to, to the general public. And finally, for managers, and when I say finally, there's probably so many others, but these are all the things that I found that managers and governance people wanted to hear, but I've always thought about information as a means for a manager or a leader making better decisions. How much overtime did we spend in the last two weeks? If you think about that from a manual process, it's much more difficult than if you can just punch a couple of keys and see how much overtime was spent. Or where are we with our budget today? Are we in our second month or already spent the first quarter's worth of our budget? I think the first and foremost sell is to show management the technology will allow them to be able to better control their organization, better achieve their mission. And that's the first sell. And so if I was a technology person in a nonprofit today or in any business today, my first customer internally would be my management. How can I do things that management would say, oh, this really helps me? Because if they buy in, they're going to dedicate the resources that you need to expand technology throughout the organization. They're going to see a value. So let me stop there before I go on. And I know I'm going to already buy it after one. So and what are your thoughts about the, these items for discussion with management about buying? It has been, to me, the painful lesson of learning to work in an organization. I used to be like, oh, the quality of the work will speak for itself. And that, of course, was foolish naivete. Yeah, so the internal salesmanship, the internal work of, of getting people excited and on board and in alignment is truly half the work to get real change happening in an organization. So I just like that you're leaning into this because I always try and bypass it and then regret that choice. <laughs> I've learned the hard way with many of these things. But that military experience I had, where commanders saw how quickly they could communicate up and down the chain of command with technology was a major selling point. And I will say, I don't want to make it sound like it was all honey and sweet, because those that have to respond to these quick requests for information 
are often not as happy as the person who requested the information and expected a quick return because technology does have a tendency, and I know all of you have experienced this, to raise expectations and a, a urgency of reply. So, Eric, what's up? So I, I have a situation at my church. For the last couple of years, our church, like many, have had virtual services. And we're now just in, we're now just getting back into in-person, but also continuing with virtual. So we're putting together a audiovisual system, cameras and microphones and, and whatnot. And, and we're just kind of band-aiding it together right now, but we want to buy some real equipment. So we're trying to sell that to the board. And we've tried to sell it one time so far. It got kicked back with needing more justification for it. So I um, wonder if you have any thoughts about that. I've been involved with several church projects going virtual. Most of them have bought into a service that provides all of the equipment and does all the scheduling and does all the hosting. And I'd be happy to get you information about that and send it to you. But basically, they make sure that the, the service, and I, I did, I'm on parish council too. I'm, I have this flaw where I can't say no when it comes to some of these organizations. And so I sometimes overcommit. But my church did this virtual thing. And so when I started to ask questions about it, they said, what we do is we just subscribe to this this church, this, this organ, this company that basically tailors to virtual services and they put all of the equipment in for a fee. It's like a monthly fee. And, and so if something goes bad, there's no, there's no, the church people don't have to worry about servicing it or the broadcast or the on-site equipment that I can, de I definitely, I can reach out to the lot senior that I was working with and say, give me more information about that and get it to you. But that's the best I could do at this point in time. Will that help, Eric? Uh, yeah, yeah, sorry. <clears throat> yeah, it, I think that will help. Although, or, or uh, you know, it depends on what the cost is. Our board, or, or board of trustees is very cost resistant. <laughs> and uh, the thought is we also want to be able to rent out our facilities to others to come in to use it. It's so having our own equipment may be a good thing. Is it, that is your definitely options. And that's definitely an entrepreneurial way of offsetting the costs. And so as a nonprofit, it's funny because you bring up another topic and I'll just say it briefly. Is every nonprofit is looking how to raise money. And the old fashioned way, of course, is raffles, bake sales, dinners. My nonprofit didn't do that. What my profit nonprofit did is using my interns was write professional custom software, which we actually, in the case of my organization, which we sold to the state of Pennsylvania. And for a five-year contract, it was over a million dollars. And that was a way to generate revenue for the nonprofit that was a lot easier than doing a lot of the small nonprofits that no one takes into time into account what the, the cost of the time is. Now we did do it as an unrelated business activity, which meant we paid tax on the profit. So we did jeopardize our final one C three stats, but it did give us a lot of credibility because people couldn't understand or people thought, how can this nonprofit be developing software? To the state of Pennsylvania. And so I throw that out because it's out of the box thing, but you made me think about it when you said you're going to do something and make it available to the public, basically, or other organizations, they could be all nonprofits, to raise some money. And that's a good way of saying to your board, this will sell fun over a period of time. So uh, I will ask those questions to get back to you. I owe you yes. response. Well, one, one last thing, Did, does TechSoup um, have any discounted audiovisual equipment? Can you speak to that directly? Yeah, there have been sometimes through the catalog, things like uh, projectors 
have come through, but I would say it's, it's, it's not reliably there in the catalog. So it's one of those things that comes and goes, but definitely worth taking a look there. The other thing is there's also things like a wireless hub. So if you don't necessarily have like good internet at that space, you can actually get onto like cell network modems instead. So that can sometimes be a backup way to get onto connections, depending on, on where you're like hosting this event. Okay. Another option here is to consider reaching out to some of the major sound system companies. We did this at, in our chamber to see if they would donate certain types of sound equipment as a tax write-off. And we were successful at getting some of that done. We didn't get everything we wanted, but some of the major companies like Bose and Sonus and Klipsch, they all have donation programs. That, so that would be something else that I would just do a little bit of research in and mm -hmm. try to explain, especially for church services. I, that would be the only thing I emphasize is that they want to make more church services virtual because that definitely would be a tax deductible expense for them. Okay, good. Thank you. Anything else on this one? I want to talk a little bit about allocating technology costs. Now, this one. I, I don't know if we're going to fall on dead ears with this or not, but I really, if you're running a nonprofit, one of the key things that always comes up is what's the technology budget. And if you're not building a technology budget, I think you're making a huge mistake. Just Bob's opinion. That's all. Because if you don't build a budget, then you don't really know what the ongoing costs are going to be. And all of this stuff has a shelf life. It's, you're going to have annual costs for, and I try to identify what some of the common technology costs are, like the infrastructure in the building, which never cut corners with infrastructure, like the wiring or the wireless access points or the switches or the servers or the broadband, if you have it in your area, the maintenance and provider fees, the backup solution, which a lot of people skip and virus, spam, filters, those kinds of things. If you don't have, it's almost like building a home and, and doing it like on the dime and then realize that when you put the roof on, you can't substantiate that the rest of the house collapses because the infrastructure is bad. And so I, I can't overemphasize this. I remember again, when I talked back to my army days, I was highly criticized for when it came time, and at that point in time, I was overseeing technology implementation of the five states. I was highly criticized for making a decision to do fiber optics across the fiber state, five states. And this was in 1995 when a 10 megabyte switch was considered very high speed, whereas today it's in the gigabytes that's considered very high speed. But my view was is running cable or running fiber across five states is going to be expensive. But if you're going to pull something that gives you some future expansion, and if you just pull what you need for today, you're going to be doing it again in a pretty short period of time. So when you try to sell the infrastructure, you want to sell a vision that content continues to grow in size, that everybody wants more speed every day, that people get addicted to the use of technology, that you're always going to be finding new uses for technology. And so you want the best you can afford now. And, and cutting on infrastructure is the worst place you can cut because once it's done, it's not easily to replace. So having said that, and I, I grouped these because infrastructure is probably considered a common cost. Everybody who uses it is, everybody who uses technology is sharing the infrastructure. So that type of cost, from my perspective, can be shared, can be allocated among the pieces. So again, I hope this makes sense. But in the sake of like the organization that I manage, community action, I always visualized as an umbrella. And under the umbrella of community action, there was the program called weatherization, where you would go out and weatherize people's homes and adult education, which I think everybody understands and workforce development. And there, we had 30 of these services under the umbrella of 
community action. In my view was, is that all those programs under the umbrella were going to use the common infrastructure of technology. So they should be able to pay a piece of it. And it would not be considered then something that the management using admin funds had to absorb. So the key was on the accounting side, determining how to best allocate the, the common class. So we decided that we ended up using staff hours. So if a program had a hundred staff hours a year, they paid one hundredth of whatever the total proportion was of the total staff hours was our method of allocating staff of common costs. Now, there could be many other techniques. You may say, I don't want to use staff hours. I want to use full-time equivalent, or I want to use budget transactions. You can't use, if you're getting any federal or state money, you cannot use certain things. Like you can't use total budget. That's one of the disallowed costs. But there are a lot that are allowed. And I only bring this topic up because if you try to put all of your technology costs into administration, then you're going to find that usually technology is unaffordable. You have to be able to sell the <laughs> technology is required to provide most of the services of the organization. And if those services are considered to benefit a consumer, then they're not really administrative in nature. So I, I hope that makes sense that don't get stuck with the paradigm that technology is an administrative cost. And I've had this tested many times over the time we implemented technology in my nonprofit. And it always came out, that makes sense. If you need technology to do case management, then the te that technology is not considered administrative. Now, if you need technology to do accounting, that is administrative. So think about the use of the technology to figure out how to allocate it. And then is it a program or is it administrative cost? I had a controller who was going to be on the call today. The last minute she, she texted me saying, I, I can't do this today because I wanted her to get into some more detail. But I think that if you just think about the concept that I articulated on this slide, have a budget, identify what the common costs are, determine of, of the common costs, how do you allocate it out to the various components of your organization? And then of those components, what's administrative and what isn't administrative. And it's all based on how it's used. If it's used in a program manner, it's program cost. If it's used in, a in an administrative manner, it's an administrative cost. Because most nonprofits have very little administrative costs to work with. Maybe a 5%, 3%, 7%, 10% administrative costs. Any questions on that one? Does it make sense? This, I'm shocked when I go, I, one of the things I did when I left my job as executive director is I became a consultant to other nonprofits and helped me with technology. And I was shocked when I would go in and I took the budgets. First of all, many of them did not have a technology budget, which I think is a huge mistake. You, you need to be able to capture what your technology costs are the same way you do your building costs, your personnel costs, your insurance costs, all those things that are going to be reoccurring every year because they will need to be replaced and upgraded and so on. And then the next thing was, is I usually found them all in the admin budget. And it's they eat up most of your costs because they're in the admin budget. So I decided this was something that really needed to be looked at. Another thing that, that I wanted to just talk about in the few minutes we have left is matching technologies to the environment. And the reason why I threw this one in here is I think you have to consider what kind of organization you have and what technology do you really need? One of the things we've already hit on, for example, is in the, in the earlier days, all technology was basically on site. You had servers on site, you had email servers, you had application servers, you had a lot of infrastructure on site. And that now in today's environment, a lot of that hardware doesn't need to be on site if you have decent bandwidth. If you have decent bandwidth, then you can do a lot of this stuff through cloud computing. 
where you're using a server that's located in some server cloud, which again, I know is hard to articulate for some people, but it, it could be a server located in Madison, Wisconsin, or any place else in the country. It doesn't really make any difference with the speed that, that bits and bytes travel. That, and that some of the benefits of the cloud computing is they take care of the hardware. If the hardware needs upgraded, they take care of it. If you're worried about backups, they take care of the backups. So you offset a lot of the technology functions and tasks to the cloud-based organizations maintaining your equipment. With Microsoft Office Suite or with the Google Office Suite, a lot of that can be done in the cloud. So you don't have to worry about having these applications on a server internally and making sure they're all current, making sure the applications are current, making sure the, the operating systems are current. It, 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 they're always being patched for the sake of security reasons. The, another solid advantage of that is they're available to you from anywhere. They're available to you from your home. If you want to make them available for offsite, they can be locked down just for certain locations, or they can be made available to use anywhere in the country or anywhere outside the country. So that's some of the basics. Now, if you're a huge corporation, maybe you determine, I need a bank of servers internal. I have the staff to maintain those things internally. We're writing our own code. So we want to do that internally. So you really need to analyze what you want to do with technology to the, what your technology needs are. And again, there's a lot of people out there that can help you do that, including myself. One of the last jobs I did for another agency located actually in the Delaware County part of the state was they put together a matrix. And on that matrix, I said, Basically, here's the technology tabs. Here's something I think that should be done by your technology staff. Here's, a, here's something that I think should be contracted out. Here's something I think you should go get an intern to do and try to figure out, like, what are these tasks that you can done and where do they best sit in terms of who could do? So that was just some other way of, of trying to make people think more about this. Because if you get a, if you, if you bring a provider in there, they're going to not necessarily do what's in your best interest. They're going to do what's in their best interest. And you'll defer to them because you're not necessarily knowledgeable. So one of your responsibilities is to at least come up to speed where you can ask good questions and feel comfortable about the answer you've got. And say, oh, yeah, that makes sense. I, I see now your point. Otherwise, you get uh, railroaded into a decision that may not be the best fit for you. Any questions on this one? I mentioned this already in something, so we'll spend a long time with it. I, I always, this force multiplier term is a military term. They're using technology as a force multiplier. I have to add, when I picked this term up in the mid nineties, we didn't think about technology as being a threat, but it's definitely something you need to think about today. Technology is a force multiplier, but if it's not implemented correctly, it's also a threat. You have to have read about hackings, ransomware. One of the people I invited on this call today was the technology director at a local school district. And last year, he, his, his servers were taken under ransomware. And the insurance company and the, they were paying about $15,000 a year, by the way, for cybersecurity. And I sit on the school board, by the way. And this year, the cheapest thing they could find for cybersecurity was $57,000. And part of that was because they had a ransomware last year, which between the school district and the insurance company paid down $150,000. And, and I know you probably don't think about this, but if you get any kind of federal or state money, data is covered by a lot of rules and regulations at the federal and state level. For example, when you put two pieces of data together, like your name and your phone number, it's considered personally identifiable information and technically should be encrypted at, from the workstation level the whole way up. And I know in my school district, it's not encrypted any place. And one of the reasons it isn't is because it's not that easy to do. 
and nobody thinks about it, and when you have hundreds and hundreds of workstations like a school district does, it becomes hard to do. I know I'm downsizing. I'm, I'm, it's always, in my perspective, knowing what your threats are is as important as knowing what your benefits are. You're hoping the benefits outweigh the threats, and they surely can if you take precautions. And the biggest precaution you can take in technology is educating the user. Because I don't care what you put into place from a technology perspective, if you don't do education, it isn't going to make any difference. Somebody that the biggest fault line you have is the user. But, you know, definitely technology improves internal and external communications and collaborations. I believe technology should always be used for decision support systems. I think that's one of the key factors in being able to analyze data and information and making better decisions. Obviously, in today's world, you can use social media to enhance the organization, promote the organization, assist in fundraising. I think this whole issue of improving customer service should be another high priority and lastly, employee productivity, which we already talked about. So that, that, that's where I see the benefits are. And again, you must consider the threats. And I don't know if I put one down there. Yeah, I guess I did for threats. It, it definitely will change your work environment. Technology will, will, I think, most probably change your work environment. People will rely on it every day. Yeah, I've been in environments where the power goes out, where the, tech, the infrastructure doesn't work, the internet's out. People are sitting there twiddling their thumbs because they're so reliant on technology that they don't have any backup systems to go to a manual process. I, I already mentioned that users must be trained in these controls. Again, I'm a big control freak. You have to have a technology plan. You have to know when your hardware and software need updated. Encryption is a big factor. If you're dealing with PII data, personally identifiable information, equipment must be maintained. You have to have some kind of standard. I would not let people be installing all kinds of software on equipment. It should, there should be some standard that said, everybody's going to use Microsoft Office. Everywhere, everybody's going to be using Google desktop software. Because the more you allow the standard to deviate, the harder it will be to control it. So that's today's presentation. I hope you felt that it was valuable. Any, I appreciate any feedback you have as well as and any topics you'd like to see us cover for the next time we do this, which I hope will be no later than 60 days from today. Robert, about risk assessments, it would be good to talk about password controls and security around passwords, I think. Okay. I know we, we end up using the same password and it's shared among people and it's really a terrible situation. In, in my organization, because we were writing software for the state, we had to implement the state's password control, which was random passwords consisting of upper, lower case numbers, special symbols. That was required to do business with the state of Pennsylvania. People hate that password changed every 60 days. People hate it then too. But it's, there's nothing worse than having uh, a data breach. And then you have to, one of the reasons the school's data, it costs them so much money is every user on the school system had to be provided with free monitoring of their data from like Norton's data security, life lock, and those kinds of things that you probably heard about. They had to be provided free to every user because to, to make sure that their data had not gone into the wrong hands. So that's one of those things about user training. And I think if the user understands what risks the organization has and what personal risks they may have, all of a sudden it is a pain in the butt that they get better at using password protection. So really good point, Eric. What else would you like to see us talk about? The whole cybersecurity thing is not going away. And, and I think with what's going on in the Ukraine and the threats that are being made by Russia that we haven't even begun to see, see the cybersecurity attacks that we're probably going to see as time goes by. It's one of the few things they can do basically to retaliate. 
And who would have thought your local Punxsutawney area school district would be attacked with the ransomware? You know what I mean? We don't think about it until it happens locally. And a lot of times, even on your own home computer, particularly if you're using your own computer to remotely access your work data, then your home computer ought to have some kind of uh, security system installed on it too, whether that be your e or something, just to, to help make sure that you're protecting it. And there's a lot of ways to look at an email and say, no, nah, I don't think this came from Microsoft, or I don't think this came from Symantec. And there's a ways to study the URL that it came with, the, to the address that, that it was attached to, to say, that's not an official Microsoft email. But before you click the link, it's in the email, which then you know, causes a lot of problem on your computer, particularly if you have no vulnerability software on your computer. Thank you. Well, I, I hope you guys find this useful. And, uh, I, and please, you have my email. If you think of any other topics, shoot in my way. If you think of any other organization that could benefit from this kind of information, please forward maybe today's recording and encourage them to register. The more we get involved, the more we can form basically like a support network of our own. Feel free to reach out if you have questions or comments. And if I can answer any or if I can't, many of my former interns are working for three-letter agencies or yeah. security. Two of them are school technology directors. One has 17 individuals working for them at the school district. We have a lot of resources out there we can tap into on our own. And so it's, it's a way of getting some free advice. And I'm reaching out here on the topics that we talked about. And I have to read now, so I'll get back to you. Thank you. Thank you guys very much. I appreciate no, uh, you. Your participating today. And uh, help us spread the word. Help us get more people involved. And uh, I look forward to the next meeting. Sounds good. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Bye-bye.